Closing arguments. Now let's go back out live right now to the Senate floor. President Trump's defense team is delivering their closing arguments. At the end of the day, this is an effort to overturn the results of one election and to try to interfere in the coming election that begins today in Iowa. And we believe that the only proper result, if we're applying the golden rule of impeachment, if we're applying the rules of impeachment that were so eloquently stated by members of the Democratic Party the last time we were here, the only appropriate result here is to acquit the president and to leave it to the voters to choose their president. With that, I'll turn it over to Judge Ken Starr, and we'll move through a series of short presentations. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, Majority Leader McConnell, Minority Leader Schumer, House impeachment managers, and their very able staff. As uh, World War I, the war to end all wars was drawing to a close, an American soldier sat down at a piano and composed a song. It was designed to be part of a musical review for his army camp out on Long Island, Suffolk County. The song was God Bless America. The composer, of course, was Irving Berlin, who came here at the age of five, son of immigrants who came to this country for freedom. As composers are wont to do, Berlin worked very carefully with the lyrics. The song needed to be pure. It needed to be above politics, above partisanship. He intended it to be a song for all America. But he intended it to be more than just a song. It was to be a prayer for the country. As your very distinguished chaplain, Admiral Barry Black, has done in his prayers on these long days that you've spent as judges in the high court of impeachment, we've been reminded of what our country is all about and that it stands for one nation under God. The nation is about freedom. And we hear the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. in his dream-filled speech about freedom, echoing the great passages inscribed on America's temple of justice, the Lincoln Memorial, which stood behind Dr. King as he spoke on that historic day. Dr. King is gone, fell by an assassin's bullet, but his words remain with us. And during his magnificent life, Dr. King spoke not only about freedom, freedom standing alone. He spoke frequently about freedom and justice. And in his speeches, he summed up regularly the words of a Unitarian abolitionist from the prior century, Theodore Parker who referred to the moral arc of the universe, the long moral arc of the universe, points toward justice, freedom and justice. Freedom whose contours have been shaped over the centuries in the English-speaking world by what Justice Benjamin Cardozo called the authentic forms of justice through which the community expresses itself in law. Authentic, authenticity. And at the foundation of those authentic forms of justice is fundamental fairness. It's playing by the rules. It's why we don't allow deflated footballs or stealing signs from the field. Rules are rules. They are to be followed. And so I submit that a key question to be asked as you begin your deliberations, were the rules here faithfully followed? If not, if that is your judgment, then with all due respect, the prosecutors should not be rewarded, just as federal prosecutors are not rewarded. 
you didn't follow the rules. You should have. As a young lawyer, I was blessed to work with one of the great trial lawyers of his time. And I asked him, Dit, what's your secret? He had just defended successfully a former United States senator who was charged with a serious offense, perjury, before a federal grand jury. His response was simple and forthright. His words could have come from prairie lawyer Abe Lincoln. I let the judge and the jury know that they can believe and trust every word that comes out of my mouth. I will not be proven wrong. And so here's a question as you begin your deliberations. Have the facts as presented to you as a court, as the High Court of Impeachment, proven trustworthy? Has there been full and fair disclosure in the course of these proceedings? Fundamental fairness. I recall these words from the podium last week. A point would be made by one of the president's lawyers, and then this would follow. The house managers didn't tell you that. Why not? And again, the house managers didn't tell you that. Why not? At the Justice Department on the fifth floor of the Robert F. Kennedy Building is this simple inscription. The United States wins its point when justice is done its citizens in the courts. Not did we win, not did we convict, rather the moral question was justice done. Of course, as has been said frequently, the House of Representatives does, under our Constitution, enjoy the sole power of impeachment. No one has disputed that fact. They've got the power. But that doesn't mean that anything goes. It doesn't mean that the House cannot be called to account in the High Court of Impeachment for its actions in exercising that power. A question to be asked, are we to countenance violations of the rules and traditional procedures that have been followed scrupulously in prior impeachment proceedings? And the Judiciary Committee, the venerable Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives, Compare and contrast the thoroughness of that committee in the age of Nixon, its thoroughness in the age of Clinton with all of its divisiveness within the committee in this proceeding. A question to be asked. Did the House Judiciary Committee rush to judgment in fashioning the articles of impeachment? Did it cath carefully gather the facts, assess the facts, before it concluded, we need nothing more than the panel of very distinguished professors and the splendid presentations by both the majority council and the minority council. We asked them questions. The Republicans asked them questions. We heard their answers. We're ready to vote. We're ready to try this case in the High Court of Impeachment. What was being said in the sounds of silence was this. We don't have time to follow the rules. We won't even allow the House Judiciary Minority members who have been besieging us time and again to have their day just one day to call their witnesses. Oh yes, that is expressly provided for in the rules. We'll break those rules. That's not liberty and justice for all. The great political scientist of yesteryear, Richard Neustadt of Columbia, 
observed that the power of the president is ultimately the power to persuade. Oh yes, the commander in chief, and yes, charged with the conduct and authority to guide the nation's foreign relations. But ultimately, it's the power to persuade. I suggest to you that so too, the House's sole power to impeach is likewise ultimately a power to persuade over in the House. A question to be asked. In the fast track impeachment process in the House of Representatives, the House majority persuade the American people. Not just partisans, rather, did the House's case win over the overwhelming majority of consensus of the American people? The question fairly to be asked. Will I cast my vote to convict and remove the President of the United States when not a single member of the President's party, the party of Lincoln, was persuaded at any time in the process? In contrast, and when I was here last week, I noted for the record of these proceedings that in the Nixon impeachment, the House vote to authorize the impeachment inquiry was 410 to four. In the Clinton impeachment, divisive, controversial, 31 Democrats voted in favor of the impeachment inquiry. Here, of course, and in sharp contrast, the answer is none. It is said that we live in highly and perhaps hopelessly partisan times. It is said that no one is open to persuasion anymore. They're getting their news entirely from their favorite media platform. And that platform of choice is fatally deterministic. Well, at least the decision of decision makers under oath who are bound by sacred duty, by oath or affirmation to do impartial justice, leaves the platforms out. Those modern day intermediaries and shapers of thought, of expression, of opinion are outside these walls where you serve. Finally, does what is before this court, very energetically described by the able house managers, but fairly viewed, rise to the level of a high crime or a misdemeanor? One so grave and so serious to bring about the profound disruption of the Article II branch, the disruption of the government, and to tell the American people, and yes, I will say, this is the way it would be read. Your vote in the last election is hereby declared null and void. And by the way, we're not going to allow you, the American people, to sit in judgment on this president and his record in November. That is neither freedom nor is it justice. It's certainly not consistent with the most basic freedom of we, the people, the freedom to vote. I thank the court. I yield to my colleague, Mr. Pupura. Mr. Chief Justice. Members of the Senate, good afternoon. I will be relatively brief today and will not repeat the arguments that we've made throughout, but I just want to highlight a few things. There are a number of reasons why the articles of impeachment are deficient and must fail. My colleagues have spent the past week describing those reasons. In my time today, I'd like to review just a few core facts, which again 
remember, are all drawn from the record on which the president was impeached in the House and that the House managers brought to this body in support of the president's removal. First, the president did not condition security assistance or a meeting on anything during the July 25 call. In fact, both Ambassador Yovanovitch and Mr. Tim Morrison confirmed that the Javelin missiles and the security assistance were completely unrelated. The concerns that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman expressed on the call were, by his own words and admission, based on deep policy concerns. And remember, as we said before, and everyone in this room knows, the president sets the foreign policy. The unelected staff implements the foreign policy. Others on the call, including Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's boss, Mr. Morrison, as well as Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, had no such concerns and have stated that they have heard nothing improper, unlawful, or otherwise troubling on the July 25 call. Second, President Zelensky and his top advisors agreed that there was nothing wrong with the July 25 call and that they felt no pressure from President Trump. President Zelensky said that the call was good, normal, and no one pushed me. President Zelensky's top advisor, Andrei Yermak, was asked if he had ever felt there was a connection between the U.S. military aid and the requests for investigations. He was adamant that we never had that feeling and we did not have the feeling that this aid was connected to any one specific issue. Several other top Ukrainian officials have said the same, both publicly and in readouts of the July 25 call to Ambassador Taylor, Ambassador Volker, and others. Third, President Zelensky and the highest levels of the Ukrainian government did not learn of the pause until August 28, 2019, more than a month after the July 25 call between President Trump and President Zelensky. President Zelensky himself said, I had no idea the military aid was held up. When I did find out, I raised it with Pence at a meeting in Warsaw, referring to the vice president. The meeting in Warsaw took place three days after the Politico article was published on September 1st, 2019. Mr. Yermak likewise said that President Zelensky and his key advisors learned of the pause only from the August 28th Politico article. And just last week, while we were in this trial, Alexander Daniluk, former chairman of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, said he first found out that the U.S. was withholding aid to Ukraine by reading Politico's article published August 28. Mr. Daniluk also said there was panic within the Zelensky administration when they found out about the hold from the Politico article, indicating that the highest levels of the administration were unaware of the pause until the article was published. And if that's not enough, Ambassador Volker, Ambassador Taylor, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State George Kent, and Mr. Morrison all also testified that the Ukrainians did not know about the security hold until the Politico article on August 28. And we showed you the text message from Mr. Yermak to Ambassador Volker just hours after the Politico article was published. You also remember all of the high-level bilateral meetings at which the Ukrainians did not bring up the pause in the security assistance because they did not know about it. When they did find out on August 28, they raised the issue at the very next meeting in Warsaw on September 1st. This is a really important point. As Ambassador Volker testified, if the Ukrainians didn't know about the pause, then there was no leverage implied. That's why the House managers have kept claiming and continue to claim throughout the trial that the high-level Ukrainians somehow knew about the pause before late August. That's inaccurate. We pointed out that Laura Cooper, on whom they rely, testified that she didn't really know what the emails she saw relating to security assistance were about. We told you that Catherine Croft, who worked for Ambassador Volker, who worked for Ambassador Volker, couldn't remember the specifics of when she believed the Ukrainian embassy learned of the pause and that she didn't remember 
when news of the pause became public. The House managers also mentioned Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who claimed to have vague recollections of fielding unspecified queries about aid from Ukrainians in the mid-August time frame. But Lieutenant Colonel Vindman ultimately agreed that the Ukrainians first learned about the hold on security assistance probably around when the first stories emerged in the open source. And former Deputy Foreign Minister Olena Zirkal's claim that she knew about the pause in July is inconsistent with statements by her boss, the then Foreign Minister of Ukraine, who said that he learned of the pause from a news article, of which the August 28 Politico article was the first, as well as those of all of the other top-level Ukrainian officials I've mentioned, the testimony of the top U.S. diplomats responsible for Ukraine, and the many intervening meetings at which the pause was not mentioned. Fourth, none of the House witnesses testified that President Trump ever said there was any linkage between security assistance and investigations. When Ambassador Sondland asked the President on approximately September 9, the President told him, I want nothing. I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. Before he asked the President, Ambassador Sondland presumed and told Ambassador Taylor and Mr. Morrison that there was a connection between the security assistance and the investigations. That was before he asked the President directly. Even earlier, on August 31, Senator Ron Johnson asked the President if there was any connection between security assistance and investigations. The President answered, no way, I would never do that. Who told you that? Under Secretary of State David Hale, Mr. Kent, and Ambassador Volker all testified that they were not aware of any connection whatsoever between security assistance and investigations. The House managers repeatedly point to a statement by Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney during an October press conference. When it became clear that the media was misinterpreting his comments or that he had simply misspoken, Mr. Mulvaney promptly, on the very day of the press conference, issued a written statement making clear that there was no quid pro quo. Here's his statement. Let me be clear. There was absolutely no quid pro quo between Ukrainian military aid and any investigation into the 2016 election. The President never told me to withhold any money until the Ukrainians did anything related to the server. The only reasons we were holding the money was because of concern about lack of support from other nations and concerns over corruption. Accordingly, Mr. Mulvaney in no way confirmed a link between the pause security assistance and investigations. A garbled or misinterpreted statement or a mistaken statement that is promptly clarified on the same day as the original statement is not the kind of reliable evidence that would lead to the removal of the President of the United States from office. And in any event, Mr. Mulvaney also stated during the press conference itself that the money held up had absolutely nothing to do with Biden. Now, why does this all matter? I think Senator Romney really got to the heart of this issue on Thursday evening when he asked both parties whether there is any evidence that President Trump directed anyone to tell the Ukrainians that security assistance was being held up on the condition of an investigation into the Bidens. That was the question. There is no such evidence. Fifth, the security assistance was released when the President's concerns with burden sharing and corruption were addressed by a number of people, including some in this chamber today, without Ukraine ever announcing or undertaking any investigations. You have heard repeatedly that no one in the administration knew why the security assistance was paused. That's not true. Two of the House manager's own witnesses testified regarding the reason for the pause. As Mr. Morrison testified, at a July meeting attended by officials throughout the executive branch agencies, the reason provided for the pause by a representative from the Office of Management and Budget was that the President was concerned about corruption in Ukraine and he wanted to make sure that Ukraine was doing enough to manage that corruption. Further, according to Mark Sandy, Deputy Associate Director for National Security at the Office of Management and Budget, we had received requests for additional information on what other countries were contributing to Ukraine. 
We told you about the work that was being done to monitor and collect information about anti-corruption reforms in Ukraine and burden sharing during the summer pause. We told you about how, when President Zelensky asked Vice President Pence in Poland about the pause, Vice President Pence asked, according to Jennifer Williams, what the status of his reform efforts were that we, he could then convey back to the president and also wanting to hear if there was more that European countries could do to support Ukraine. Mr. Morrison, who was actually at the Warsaw meeting, testified similarly that Vice President Pence delivered a message about anti-corruption and burden sharing. We told you about the September 11 call with President Trump, Senator Portman, and Vice President Pence. Mr. Morrison testified the entire process, culminating in the September 11 call, gave the president the confidence he needed to approve the release of the security sector assistance, all without any investigations being announced. Now, I've focused so far on the House manager's allegation that there was a quid pro quo for the security assistance. Let me turn very briefly to the claim that a presidential meeting was also conditioned on investigations. Remember, by the end of the July 25 call, President Trump had personally invited President Zelensky to meet three times, twice by phone, once in a letter, without any preconditions. You heard that the White House was working behind the scenes to schedule the meeting and how difficult scheduling those meetings can be. The two presidents planned to meet in Warsaw, just as President Zelensky requested on the July 25 call. President Trump had to cancel at the last minute due to Hurricane Dorian. President Trump and President Zelensky then met three weeks later in New York without Ukraine announcing any investigations. Finally, one thing that the House managers' witnesses agreed upon was that President Trump has strengthened the relationship between the U.S. and Ukraine and that he has been a better friend to Ukraine and stronger opponent of Russian aggression than President Obama. Most notably, Ambassador Taylor, Ambassador Volker, and Ambassador Yovanovitch all testified that President Trump's reversal of his predecessor's refusal to send the Ukrainians lethal aid was a meaningful and significant policy development and improvement for which President Trump deserves credit. Just last week, Ambassador Volker, who knows more about U.S.-Ukraine relationships than nearly, if not everyone, published a piece in Foreign Policy magazine. I'd like to read you an excerpt. Beginning in mid-2017 and continuing until the impeachment investigation began in September 2019, U.S. policy toward Ukraine was strong, consistent, and enjoyed support across the administration, bipartisan support in Congress, and support among U.S. allies and in Ukraine itself. The Trump administration also coordinated Ukraine policy closely with allies in Europe and Canada, maintaining a united front against Russian aggression and in favor of Ukraine's democracy, reform, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. Ukraine policy is one of the few areas where U.S. and European policies have been in lockstep. The administration lifted the Obama-era ban on the sale of lethal defensive arms to Ukraine, delivering, among other things, Javelin anti-tank missiles, Coast Guard cutters, and anti-sniper systems. Despite the recent furor over the pause in U.S. security assistance this past summer, the circumstances of which are the topic of impeachment hearings, U.S. defensive support for Ukraine has been and remains robust, and more, according to Ambassador Volker. It is therefore a tragedy for both the United States and Ukraine that U.S. partisan politics, which have culminated in the ongoing impeachment process, have left Ukraine and its new reform-minded President Vladimir Zelensky exposed and relatively isolated. The only one who benefits from this is Russian President Vladimir Putin. Those are the words of Ambassador Volker. He was one of the House manager's key witnesses. He was the very first witness to testify in the House proceedings on October 3rd. And so I think it's fitting that he may be the last witness we hear from. In his parting words, Ambassador Volker admonishes that it is U.S. partisan politics which have culminated in this impeachment process that have imperiled Ukraine. In sum, 
The House manager's case is not overwhelming, and it is not undisputed. The House managers bear the very heavy burden of proof. They did not meet it. It's not because they didn't get the additional witnesses or documents that they failed to pursue. It's because their own witnesses have already offered substantial evidence undermining their case. And importantly, as you have heard from Professor Dershowitz and from Mr. Philbin, the first article does not support or allege an impeachable offense regardless of any additional witnesses or documents. Members of the Senate, it has been an incredible honor and privilege to speak to you in this chamber. I hope that what I've shown has been helpful to your understanding of the facts, and I respectfully ask you to vote to acquit the President of the wrongful charges against him. I yield to Mr. Philbin. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, we've heard repeatedly throughout the past week and a half or so that the President is not above the law. And I'd like to focus in my last remarks here on an equally important principle, which is that the House of Representatives also is not above the law in the way they conduct the impeachment proceedings and bring a matter here before the Senate. Because in very significant and important respects, they didn't follow the law. From the outset, they began an impeachment inquiry here without a vote from the House and therefore without lawful authority delegated to any committees to begin an impeachment inquiry against the President of the United States. That was unprecedented in our history. The Speaker of the House does not have authority by holding a press conference to delegate the sole power of impeachment from the House to a committee. And the result was 23 totally unauthorized and invalid subpoenas were issued as a beginning of this impeachment inquiry. After that, the House violated every principle of due process and fundamental fairness in the way the hearings were conducted. And we've been through that. I'm not going to go through the details again. But it's significant because denying the President the ability to be present through counsel, to cross-examine witnesses, and to present evidence fundamentally skewed the proceedings in the House of Representatives left the president without the ability to have a fair proceeding, and it meant it reflected the fact that those proceedings were not truly designed as a search for truth. We have procedural protections. We have the right of cross-examination as a mechanism for getting to the facts, and that was not present in the House of Representatives. And lastly, Manager Schiff, as an interested witness, who had been involved in, or at least his staff, in discussions with the whistleblower, then guided the factual inquiry in the House. So why does all of this matter? It matters because the lack of the vote meant that there was no democratic accountability and no lawful authorization for the beginning of the process. It meant that there were procedural defects that produced a record that this chamber can't rely on for any conclusion other than to reject the articles of impeachment and to acquit the president. And it mattered because the president, in response to these, these uh, violations of the president's rights and to the failure to follow proper procedure, failure to follow the law, has rights of his own, rights of the executive branch to be asserted. And that's the president's response to the invalid subpoenas was that they're invalid and we're not going to comply with them. And the president asserted other rights of the executive branch. When there were subpoenas for his senior advisors to come and testify, along with virtually every president since Nixon, he asserted the principle of immunity of his senior advisors, that they could not be called to testify. And the president asserted the defects in subpoenas that called for um, executive branch officials to testify without the presence of agency counsel. All established principles that have been asserted before. Now what do the House managers say in response? They accuse the President in their 
second article of impeachment, trying to assert obstruction, that this was unprecedented response, an unprecedented refusal to cooperate. It was unprecedented that 23 subpoenas were issued in a presidential impeachment inquiry without valid authorization from the House. The president's response was to a totally unprecedented attempt by the House to do that which it had no authority to do. They've asserted today and on other occasions that the president's legal arguments in response to these subpoenas, they, they've said that it's indiscriminate. There was just a blanket defiance. I think I've shown that that wasn't true. There were three very specific legal rationales provided by the executive branch as to different defects and different subpoenas, and there were letters explaining those defects. But there was no attempt by the House to attempt an accommodations process, even though the White House offered to engage in an accommodations process. There was no attempt by the House to use other mechanisms, mechanisms to resolve the differences with the executive branch. It was just straight to impeachment. Now, they've asserted today and on other occasions that the President's counsel, that I and my colleagues have made bad faith legal arguments that are just window dressing. Now, in an ordinary court of law, one doesn't accuse opposing counsel of making bad faith arguments lightly. And if you make that accusation, it has to be backed up with analysis. But there hasn't been analysis here. There's just been accusation. When the president asserts the immunity of his senior advisors, that's a principle that's been asserted by virtually every president since Nixon. And let me read you what Attorney General Janet Reno during the Clinton administration said about this exact immunity. She said that immediate advisors to the president are immune from being compelled to testify before Congress and that, quote, the immunity such advisors enjoy from testimonial compulsion by a congressional committee is absolute and may not be overborne by competing congressional interests, end quote. And she went on to say, quote, compelling one of the president's immediate advisors to testify on a matter of executive decision making would raise serious constitutional problems no matter what the assertion of congressional need, end quote. Was that bad faith? Was Attorney General Reno asserting that principle in bad faith and President Clinton? President Obama asserted the same principle for his senior political advisor. Was that bad faith? Of course not. These are principles defending the separation of powers that presidents have asserted for decades. President Trump was defending the institutional interests of the office of the presidency in asserting the same principles here. That is vital for the continued operation of the separation of powers. Now, House managers have also said that once the president asserted these defects in their subpoenas and resisted them, they had no time to do anything else. They had to just go straight to impeachment. They couldn't accommodate. They couldn't go through a contempt process. They couldn't litigate. But the idea that there is no time for dealing with that friction with the executive branch is really antithetical to the proper functioning of the separation of powers. It goes against part of the way the separation of powers is supposed to work. That interbranch friction is meant to take time to resolve. It's meant to slow things down and to be somewhat difficult to work through and to force the branches to work together to accommodate the interests of each branch, not just to jump to the conclusion that, well, we have no time for that, we have to assert absolute authority on one side of the equation. And this is something that Justice Brandeis pointed out in a famous dissent in Myers versus the United States, but has since been cited many times by the court majority. He said, quote, the doctrine of the separation of powers was adopted by the convention of 1787 not to promote efficiency. So he's saying not to make government move quickly but to preclude the exercise of arbitrary power. The purpose was not to avoid friction, but by means of the inevitable friction incident to the distribution of the governmental powers among the departments to save the people from autocracy. That is a vitally important principle that the friction between the branches, even if it means taking longer, even if it means not jumping straight to impeachment, is part of the constitutional design. And it's required to force the branches 
to determine incrementally where their interests lie, to resolve disputes incrementally, and not to jump straight to the ultimate nuclear weapon of the Constitution. We've also heard from the House managers that everything the President did here, asserting prerogatives of his office, asserting principles of immunity, must be wrong, must be rejected, because only the guilty will assert a privilege. Only the guilty won't allow evidence. That is definitely not a principle of American jurisprudence. It's antithetical to fundamental principles of our system of laws. As we pointed out in our trial memorandum in Border Kircher versus Hayes and in other decisions, the Supreme Court has made clear that the very idea of punishing someone for asserting rights or privileges or suggesting that asserting the right or privilege is evidence of guilt is contrary to basic principles of due process. And it takes on an even more uh, malignant tenor to it when that principle is asserted in the context of a dispute between the branches relating to the boundaries of their relative powers. Because what the House is essentially asserting in this case is that any assertion of the prerogatives of the office of the president, any attempt to maintain the principles of separation of powers of executive confidentiality that have been asserted by past presidents can be treated by the House as evidence of guilt. And here their entire second article of impeachment is structured on the assumption that the House can treat the assertion of principles grounded in the separation of powers as an impeachable offense. I mean, boiled down to its essence, it is an assertion that defending the separation of powers, if the president does it in a way that they don't like, in a time that they don't like, can be treated as an impeachable offense. And that's an incredibly dangerous assertion. Because if it were accepted, it would fundamentally alter the balance between the different branches of our government. It would suggest, and Professor Turley explained this, Professor Dershowitz explained it here, that if Congress makes a demand on the executive and the executive resists, based on separation of powers principles that past presidents have asserted, Congress can nonetheless say, we've decided to proceed by impeachment. We have the sole power, and this is the principle they assert in the House Judiciary Committee report. We have the sole power of impeachment, that means we are the sole judge of our own actions. There's no need for accommodation. There's no need for the courts. We will determine that any resistance you provide is itself impeachable. That would fundamentally transform our government by essentially giving the House the same sort of power as a parliamentary system to use impeachment as, in effect, a vote of no confidence against a prime minister, not the way the framers set up our three-branch system of government with a powerful executive who would be independent from the legislature. That's why Professor Turley explained that the second article of impeachment here would be an abuse of power by Congress. It would make the executive dependent on Congress in a manner antithetical to the system that the framers envisioned. So why is it that there are all of these defects in the House manager's case for impeachment. Why are they asserting principles like only the guilty would assert privileges? That's not part of our system of law. Why are they asserting that if the executive resists, the House has the sole power to determine the boundaries of its own power in relation to the executive? Also not something that is in our system of jurisprudence. I think it's because, and why, why the lack of due process in the proceedings below? I think as we've explained, it's because this was a purely partisan impeachment from the start. It was purely partisan and purely political. And that's something that the framers foresaw. And I'll point to one passage from Federalist Number 65, a number of different passages from that have been cited over the course of the past week. But I don't think this one has. It's just after Hamilton points out, he warns that 
and impeachment in the House could be the result of persecution of an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives. And then he goes on. Though this latter supposition may seem harsh and might not likely often to be verified, yet it ought not to be forgotten that the demon of faction will, at certain seasons, extend his scepter over all numerous bodies of men. Now that's very 18th century language. We don't talk about demons extending their scepter over men, but it's prescient nonetheless. We might not be comfortable with the terms, but it's accurate for what can happen. And that is what's happened in this impeachment. This was a purely partisan political process. It was opposed bipartisanly in the House. It was done by a process that was not designed to persuade anyone or to get to the truth or to provide process and abide by past precedents. It was done to get it finished by Christmas on a political timetable. And it's not something that this chamber should condone. That in itself provides a sufficient and substantial reason for rejecting the articles of impeachment. Members of the Senate, it's been an honor to be able to address you over the past week and a half or two weeks. And I thank you for your attention, and I yield to Mr. Seculo. Mr. Chief Justice, Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, House Managers. I want to join my colleagues in thanking you for your patience over these two weeks. I want to focus on one last point. We believe that we have established overwhelmingly that both articles of impeachment fail to allege impeachable offenses and that, therefore, both articles one and two must fail. This entire campaign of impeachment that started from the very first day that the president was inaugurated was a partisan one, and it should never happen again. For three years, this push for impeachment came straight from the president's opponents, and when it finally reached a crescendo, it put this body, the United States Senate, into a horrible position. I want to start by taking a look back. On the screen is a graphic of a Washington Post headline. On January 20th, 2017, the campaign to impeach President Trump has begun. This was posted 19 minutes after he was sworn in. I also want to play a video where members, as early as January 15th, 2017, before the president was sworn into office, were calling for his impeachment. I want to say this for Donald Trump, who I may well be voting to impeach. I think that uh, he had, Donald Trump has already done a number of things which legitimately raised the question of impeachment. And I will fight every day until he is impeached. I rise today, Mr. Speaker, to call for the impeachment of the president of the United States of America. The main reason I'm interested is not so much to win the Senate, which is a byproduct, it's because I think he's committed impeachable offenses, he needs the scarlet eye, eye on his chest. But if we get to that point, then yes, I think that's grounds to start impeachment proceedings. So we're calling upon the House to begin impeachment hearings immediately. Why do you think that President Trump specifically should be impeached? Well, there are four, five reasons why we think he should be impeached. On the impeachment of Donald Trump, would you vote yes or no? I would vote yes. I would vote, I would vote to impeach. Because we're gonna go in there, we're gonna impeach the mother I introduced articles of impeachment in July of 2017. All I did yesterday was make sure that those articles did not expire. I'm concerned that if we don't impeach this president, he will get reelected. It is time to bring impeachment charges against him. My personal view is that uh, he richly deserves impeachment. One of the members of the House of Representatives said, we're bringing these articles of impeachment so he doesn't get elected again. And here we are 10 months before an election, doing exactly what they predicted. The whistleblower's lawyer, Mr. Zaid, sent out a tweet on January 30th, 2017. Let me put that up on the screen. The coup has started. First of many steps, 
rebellion, impeachment will follow ultimately. And here we are. What this body, what this nation, and what this president has just endured, what the House managers have forced upon this great body is unprecedented and unacceptable. This is exactly and precisely what the founders feared. This was the first totally partisan presidential impeachment in our nation's history, and it should be our last. What the House Democrats have done to this nation, to the Constitution, to the office of the president, to the president himself, and to this body is outrageous. They have cheapened the awesome power of impeachment, and unfortunately, of course, the country is not better for that. We urge this body to dispense with these partisan articles of impeachment for the sake of the nation, for the sake of the Constitution. As we have demonstrably proved, the articles are flawed on their face. They were a product of a reckless impeachment inquiry that violated all notions of due process and fundamental fairness. And then incredibly, incredibly, when these articles were finally brought to this chamber, without a single Republican vote, the managers then claimed that now, now they need more process. Now they need more witnesses. That all of the witnesses that they compiled and all the testimony that you heard was not enough. That your job was to do their job, the one, frankly, they failed to do. We've already said many times the charges themselves do not allege a crime or a misdemeanor, let alone a high crime or misdemeanor. There is nothing in the charges that could permit the removal of a duly elected president or warrant the negation of an election and the subversion of the American people's will. And that should be whatever party you're affiliated with. You are being asked to do this when tonight citizens of Iowa are going to be caucusing for the first caucus for the presidential season, election season, for the Democratic Party, tonight. I think there's one thing that's clear. The president has had a concern about other countries carrying their fair share of burdens, of financial aid. No one can doubt, and I think we've clearly set forth the issue of corruption in Ukraine. The President's and the Administration's policy on evaluating foreign aid and the conditions upon which it's given have been clear. Mr. Papura laid that out in great detail. The bottom line is that the President's opponents don't like the President and they really don't like his policies. They objected to the fact that the President chose not to rely each and every time on the advice of some of his subordinates. Even though he, not those unelected bureaucrats who work for him, were elected to office. The president, under our constitutional structure, is the one who decides our nation's foreign policy. Here is a perfect example. The House managers brought this up frequently. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, he admitted on page 155 of his transcript testimony that he did not know if there was a crime or anything of that nature, that's his quote, but that he, again, quote, had deep policy concerns. So there you have it. The real issue is policy disputes. Elections have consequences, we all know that. And if you do not like the policies of a particular administration or a particular candidate, you are free and welcome to vote for another candidate. But the answer is elections, not impeachment. To be clear, in our country, in the United States, the president elected by the American people is, in the words of the Supreme Court, the sole organ of the federal government in the field of international relations and foreign policy for our government. No unelected bureaucrats, 
not unhappy members of the House of Representatives. And however you were to define high crimes and misdemeanors, there is no definition that includes disagreeing with a policy decision as an acceptable ground to removal of a president of the United States. None. The first article for, of impeachment is therefore constitutionally invalid and should be immediately rejected by the Senate. Now as to the second article of impeachment, President Trump in no way obstructed Congress. The President acted with extraordinary transparency by declassifying releasing the transcript of the July 25th call and the earlier call. It is that July 25th call which is purportedly at the heart of the articles of impeachment. He did so soon after the inquiry was announced. And despite the fact that privileges applied that could have been asserted, he released them anyways in order to facilitate the House's inquiry and cut through all of it, all of the hearsay, all of the histrionics, to get the transcript out. Now, I want to take a moment, because my colleague, Deputy White House Counsel Pat Philbin, addressed this idea of privilege. I've heard over and over again, and you have too, phrases like cover-up, that the assertion of a privilege is a cover-up. Here's what the Supreme Court of the United States has said about privileges in a variety of contexts. To punish a person because he has done what the law allows him to do is a due process violation of the basic order, the basic sort. And for an agent of the state to pursue a course of action whose objective is to penalize a person's reliance on his constitutional rights is patently unconstitutional, and how much more so when you're talking about the President of the United States. How about this? And this goes in the context of assertions of privileges, other constitutional privileges. The allegation has been that if you assert a privilege, you're assumed to be guilty. That's been the assertion. Why would, why would you do that? Well, we've, we've explained at great length, and I do not want to go over that again, the importance of the executive privilege and what it means to separation of powers and the functioning of our government, but I will say this. As the Supreme Court has recognized in other contexts with other privileges, the privileges serve to protect the innocent who otherwise might be ensnared by ambiguous circumstances. In another Supreme Court case, Quinn versus the United States, the privilege this court has stated was generally regarded then as now as a privilege of great value, a protection of the innocent. The opinion goes on to say, in a safeguard against heedless, unfounded, or tyrannical prosecutions. I trace for you, and I'm not going to do it again, how all of this started. All those years ago, three years ago, how all of this began. There is no point to go over that because that evidence is undisputed, and the FISA Court's most recent orders put that in fair play. We talked about the fact that the House violated its own fundamental rules in a series of unlawful subpoenas. I won't go over that again. Mr. Philbin laid that out in great detail. But I do think it's important to note that when seeking the advice of the President's closest advisors, despite the well-known bipartisan guidance from the Department of Justice regarding immunity, the House managers asked, act as if it does not exist. They sought testimony on matters, on matters from the executive branch's confidential internal decision-making process on matters of foreign relations and national security, and that is when protections are at their highest level. Let's not forget that the House barred the attendance of executive branch counsel at witness proceedings when executive branch members were being examined. Notwithstanding these substantial abuses of process, the executive branch responded to each and every subpoena and identified the specific, sp specific deficiencies found in each. You cannot just remove constitutional violations by saying you didn't comply. You've heard that one recipient of a subpoena, and this is in fact, we've talked about it a number of times, but I think as we, we wrap up, I think it's worth seeing, saying again, one subpoena recipient did seek a declaratory judgment as to the validity of the subpoena that he had received. It was set up to go to court. A judge was gonna make a decision. The House withdrew the subpoena 
and mooted the recipient's case before the court could rule. Now, was it because they didn't like the judge that was selected? Was it because they didn't like the way the ruling was going to go? Was it they didn't mean to have that witness in the first place? Whatever the reason, there is one undisputed fact. As the case was in court, they mooted it out by removing the subpoena. The assertion of valid constitutional privileges cannot be an impeachable offense. And that's what Article 2 is based on, the obstruction of Congress. For the sake of the Constitution, for the sake of the office of the President, this body must stand as a steady bulwark against this reckless and dangerous proposition. It doesn't just affect this President. It affects every man or woman who occupies that high office. So as we said with the first article of impeachment, we believe the second article of impeachment is invalid and should also be rejected. In passing the first article of impeachment, the House attempted to usurp the President's constitutional power to determine policy, especially foreign policy. In passing the second article of impeachment, the House attempted to control the constitutional privileges and immunities of the executive branch. All of this while simultaneously disrespecting the framers' system of checks and balances, which designates the judicial branch as the arbiter of interbranch disputes. By approving both articles, the House of Representatives violated our constitutional order, illegally abused their power of impeachment in order to obstruct the President's ability to faithfully execute the duties of his office. These articles fail on their face as they do not meet the constitutional standard for impeachable offenses. No amount of testimony could change that fact. We've already discussed some of the specifics. I think um, Alexander Hamilton's been quoted a lot, and there's a reason. What has occurred over the past two weeks, really the past three months, is exactly what Alexander Hamilton and other founders of our great country feared. I believe that Hamilton was prophetic in Federal 65 when he warned how impeachment had the ability to agitate his words, the passions of the whole community, and divide it into parties more or less friendly or inimical to the accused. He warned that impeachment would, and I quote, connect itself with pre-existing fractions and will enlist all their animosities, partialities, influence and interest on one side or on the other. He continued, the convention, it appears, thought the Senate, this body, most fit as the depository of this important trust. Those who best can discern the intrinsic difficulty of the thing will be the least hasty in condemning that opinion and will be most inclined to allow due weight to the arguments which may be supposed to have produced it. In the same Federalist 65, Hamilton regarded the members of this Senate, not only as the inquisitors for the nation, but as the representatives of the, nations, the nation as a whole. He said these words, quote, where else than in the Senate could have been found a tribunal sufficiently dignified or significantly independent? What other body would be likely to feel confident enough in its own situation to preserve unawed and uninfluenced the necessary impartiality between an individual accused and the representatives of the people, his accusers. You took an oath. They questioned the oath. You are sitting here as a trier of fact. They said the Senate's on trial. Based on all of the presentations that we've made in our trial brief, and the arguments that we've put forward today, again, we believe both articles should be immediately, immediately rejected. Now, our nation's representatives holding office in this great body must unite today to protect our Constitution and separation of powers. And you know, there was a time not that long ago, even within this administration, where bipartisan agreements could be reached to serve the interests of the American people. 
Take a listen to this. Take a look. And today we had a beautiful bipartisan moment where Democrats and Republicans are working together uh, to keep that fentanyl out of our country, to use these devices uh, to accomplish that goal. It's not perfect. We need to do a lot more. But today was a very good step, and I want to praise uh, all of the people, Democrats and Republicans, and the President, for working together on this bill. Oh, as has been said, and we can see by the people assembled here, if we work together in a bipartisan way, we can get things done. And this is a place where we can all agree that we've got to do more and where we can work together. So I applaud everyone's efforts. We are proudly joined today by so many members of Congress, Republicans, Democrats, who worked very, very hard on this bill. This was really an effort of everybody. It was a bipartisan success, something you don't hear too much about, but I think you will be. I actually believe we maybe will be over the coming period of time. I hope so. I think so. It's so good for the country. Thank you, everybody. This was incredible bipartisan support. We passed this in the Senate, 87 to 12. That's unheard of. And then in the House, we passed it 358 to 36. Uh, be here to help celebrate uh, your signing uh, this uh, next step in this critical uh, women's growth and prosperity and development initiative. It dovetails nicely uh, with the Build Act, bipartisan bill you signed into law, um, with the WE Act, which recognizes this as a critical strategy. So I think this is a tremendous initiative. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. This is what the American people expect. I simply ask this body to stand firm today. Protect the integrity of the United States Senate. Stand firm today and protect the office of the President. Stand firm today and protect the Constitution. Stand firm today and protect the will of the American people and their vote. Stand firm today and protect our nation. And I ask that this partisan impeachment come to an end to restore our constitutional balance. For that is, in my view and in our view, what justice demands and the Constitution requires. With that, Mr. Chief Justice, I yield my time to the White House Counsel, Mr. Pat Cipollone. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, members of the Senate. I will leave you with just a few brief points. First, I want to express, on behalf of our entire team, our gratitude. Our gratitude to you, Mr. Chief Justice, for presiding over this trial. Our gratitude to you, Leader McConnell. Our gratitude to you, Democratic Leader Schumer, and all of you on both sides of the aisle for your time and attention. I also want to express our gra my gratitude to our team. It's large. and. With a, with a large number of people who have helped in this effort. I won't name them all, but I want to thank them for their effort and their hard work in the de defense of the Constitution, in defense of the President, in defense of the American people's right to vote. I want to thank, as members of that team, the Republican members of the House of Representatives who have also been engaged in that effort throughout this tire, entire period of time and the Democrats in the House who voted against this partisan impeachment. And I also want to thank the President of the United States for his confidence in us to send us here to represent him, to all of you in this great body, and for all he has done on behalf of the American people. I would make just a couple of additional points. Number one, as we've said repeatedly, We've never been in a situation like this in our history. We have a bi a, a, an impeachment that is purely partisan and political. It's opposed by, by, by bipartisan members of the House. It does not even allege a violation of law. It is passed in an election year, and we're sitting here on the day that election season begins in Iowa. It is wrong. There is only one answer to that. And the answer is to reject those articles of impeachment, to have confidence in the American people, to have confidence in the result of the upcoming election, to have confidence and respect for the last election and not throw it out, and to leave the choice of the president to the American people, and to leave to them also the accountability for the members of the House of Representatives who did that. 
That's what the Constitution requires. Point number two, and I think that should be done on a bipartisan basis, and that's what I ask you to do. Point number two, I believe the American people are tired of the endless investigations and false investigations that have been coming out of the House from the beginning, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Sekulow, pointed out. It is a waste of tax dollars. It is a waste of the American people's time. And I would argue, more importantly, most importantly, the opportunity cost of that, the opportunity cost of that, what you could be doing, what the House could be doing, working with the President to achieve those things on behalf of the American people is far more important than the endless investigations, the endless false attacks, the besmirching of the names of good people. This is something that we should reject together and we should move forward in a bipartisan fashion and in the way that this president has done successfully. He's achieved successful results in the economy and across so many other areas, working with you on both sides of the aisle, and he wants to continue to do that. And that's what I believe the American people want those of you elected to come here to Washington to focus on, to spend your time on, to unify us, as opposed to the bitter division that is caused by these types of proceedings. So we, at the end of the day, we put our faith in the Senate. We put our faith in the Senate because we know you will put your faith in the American people. You will leave this choice to them where it belongs. We believe that they should choose the president. We believe that this president, day after day, has put their interests first, has achieved successful results, has fulfilled the promises he made to them, and he is eager to go before the American people in this upcoming election. At the end of the day, that is the only result. It is a result, I believe, guided by your wise words from the past, that we can together end the era of impeachment, that we can together put faith in the American people, put faith in their wisdom, put faith in their judgment. That's where our founders put the power. That's where it belongs. And I urge you, on behalf of those Americans, of every American, on behalf of all of your constituents, to reject these articles of impeachment. It's the right thing for our country. The president has done nothing wrong. And these types of impeachments must end. You will vindicate the right to vote. You'll vindicate the Constitution. You'll vindicate the rule of law by rejecting, by rejecting these articles. And I ask you to do that on a bipartisan basis this week and end the era of impeachment once and for all. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to us, for your attention, and for considering our case on behalf of the President. I come here today to ask you, reject these articles of impeachment. Reject these articles of impeachment. I thank you for granting us the permission to appear here in the Senate on behalf of this president. And I ask you, on his behalf, on behalf of the American people, to reject these articles. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, it's a problem that here at the end of the trial, the President's lawyers still dispute the meaning of high crimes and misdemeanors. Some say it requires an ordinary crime or that if the President misbehaves when he thinks it's good for the country, it's okay. Neither is correct. We need to clear this up by looking at what the founders said. 
When the founders created the presidency, they gave the president great power. They'd just been through a war to get rid of a king with too much power, and they needed a check on the great power given to the president. It was late in the Constitutional Convention that they turned to the impeachment clause. Madison argued in favor of impeachment. He said it was indispensable. Mason asked, quote, shall any man be above justice? Above all, shall that man be above it who can commit the most extensive injustice? Randolph defended the propriety of impeachment since, quote, the executive will have great opportunity of abusing his power. Now, the original draft of the Constitution provided for impeachment only for treason or bribery. Mason asked, quote, why is the provision restrained to treason and bribery only? Treason, as defined in the Constitution, will not reach many great and dangerous offenses, and he added, Hastings is not guilty of treason. Attempts to subvert the Constitution might not be treason as defined. Now, Hastings' impeachment in Britain at this time was well known and it wasn't limited to a crime. They considered adding the word maladministration to capture abuse of presidential power, but Madison objected. He said so vague a term would be equivalent to tenure during the pleasure of the Senate. So maladministration was withdrawn and replaced with the more certain term, high crimes and misdemeanors, because the founders knew the law. Blackstone's commentaries, which Madison said was a book in every man's hand, described high crimes and misdemeanors as offenses against king and government. Hamilton called high crimes and misdemeanors, quote, those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. During ratification, Randolph in Virginia cited the president's receipt of presents or emoluments from a foreign power as an example. And Mason's example was a president who would, quote, pardon crimes which were advised by himself or before indictment or conviction, quote, to stop inquiry and prevent detention, uh, detection. It's clear they knew what they wrote. The president's lawyers tried to create a muddle to confuse you. Don't let them. High crimes and misdemeanors mean abuse of power against the constitutional order, conduct that is corrupt, whether or not a crime. Now, some say no impeachment when there's an election coming, but without term limits when they wrote the Constitution, there was always an election coming. If impeachment in election years was not to be, our founders would have said so. So here we are, Congress passed a law to fund Ukraine to fight the Russians who invaded their country. President Trump illegally held that funding up to coerce Ukraine to announce an investigation to hurt his strongest election opponent. He abused his power corruptly to benefit himself personally, and then he tried to cover it up. That's impeachable. The facts are clear, and so is the Constitution. The only question is what you, the Senate, will do. Now, our founders created a government where the tension between the three branches would prevent authoritarianism. No one of the branches would be allowed to grab all the power. Impeachment was to make sure the president, who had the greatest opportunity to grab power, would be held in check. It's a blunt instrument, but it's what our founders gave us. Some of the founders thought the mere existence of the impeachment clause would prevent misconduct by presidents, but sadly, they were wrong, because twice in the last half century, a president corruptly used his power to try to cheat in an election. First Nixon, with Watergate, and now another president corruptly abuses his power to cheat in an election. The founders worried about factions, what we'd call political parties. They built a system where each branch of government would jealously guard their power, not one where guarding the faction was more important than guarding the government. Opposing a president of your own party isn't easy. It wasn't easy when Republican Caldwell Butler voted to impeach Nixon in the Judiciary Committee. It wasn't easy for Senator Barry Goldwater to tell Nixon to resign. But your oath is not to do the easy thing. It's to do impartial justice. It requires conviction and removal of President Trump.
Mr. Chief Justice, Counsel for the President, Senators. Since I was a little girl and started going to church, I've been inspired by the words in scripture. Whatever you did for one of these least of my brothers, you did for me. We're called to always look out for the most vulnerable. Sometimes fighting for the most vulnerable means holding the most powerful accountable. And that's what we are here to do today. The American people will have to live with the decisions made in this chamber. In fact, senators, I believe that the decision in this case will affect the strength of democracies around the world. Democracy is a gift that each generation gives to the next one. If we say that this president can put his own interests above all else, even when lives are at stake, then we give our nation's children a weaker democracy than we inherited from those that came before us. The next generation deserves better. They are counting on us. I'm a Catholic, and my faith teaches me that we all need forgiveness. I have given this president the benefit of the doubt from the beginning. Despite my strong opposition to so many of his policies, I know that the success of our nation depends on the success of our leader. But he has let us down. Senators, we know what the president did and why he did it. This fact is seriously not in doubt. Senators on both sides of the aisle have said as much. The question for you now is, does it warrant removal from office? We say yes. We cannot simply hope that this president will realize that he has done wrong or inappropriate and hope that he does better. We have done that so many other times. We know that he has not apologized. He has not offered to change. We all know that he will do it again. What President Trump did this time pierces the heart of who we are as a country. We must stop him from further harming our democracy. We must stop him from further betraying his oath. We must stop him from tearing up our Constitution. The founders knew that in order for our republic to survive, we would need to be able to remove some of our leaders from office when they put their interests above the country's interest. Senators, we have proven that. This president committed what is called the ABCs of impeachable behavior, abusing his power, betraying the nation, and corrupting our elections. He deserves to be removed for taking the very actions that the framers feared would undermine our country. The framers designed impeachment for this very case. Senators, when I was growing up poor in South Texas, picking cotton, I confess, I didn't spend any time thinking about the framers. Like me, little girls and boys across America aren't asking at home what the framers meant by high crimes and misdemeanors. But someday, they will ask, why we didn't do anything to stop this president who's put his, who put his own interests above what was good for all of us. They will ask. They will want to understand. Senators, we inherited a democracy. Now we must protect it and pass it on to the next generation. We simply can't give our children a democracy if their president is above the law because in this country, no one is above the law. Not me, not any of you, not even this president. Nadie está por encima de la ley, nadie. 
This president must be removed. With that, I yield to my colleague, Mr. Crow. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, two weeks ago we started this trial promising to show you that the President withheld $391 million of foreign military aid to course an ally at war to help him win the 2020 election. And by many of your own admissions, we succeeded in showing you that, because the facts still matter. We also promised you that eventually all of the facts would come out, and that continues to be true. But we didn't just show you that the president abused his power and obstructed Congress. We painted a broader picture of President Trump, a picture of a man who thinks that the Constitution doesn't serve as a check on his power, but rather gives it to him in an unlimited way, a man who believes that his personal ambitions are synonymous with the good of the country, a man who, in his own words, thinks that if you're a star, they will let you do anything. In short, it's the picture of a man who will always put his own personal interests above the interests of the country that he has sworn to protect. But what's in an oath, anyway? Are they relics of the past? Do we simply recite them out of custom? To me, an oath represents a firm commitment to a life of service, a commitment to set aside your personal interest, your comfort, and your ambition to serve the greater good, a commitment to sacrifice. I explained to you last week that I believe America is great not because of the ambition of any one man, not simply because we say it's true, but because over our almost 250-year history, millions of Americans have taken the oath and they meant it. Many of them followed through on that oath by giving everything to keep it. But there is more to it than simply keeping your word because an oath is also a bond between people who have made a common promise. Perhaps the strongest example is the promise between the commander in chief and our men and women in uniform. Those men and women took the oath with the understanding that the commander in chief, our president, would always put the interests of the country in their interests above his own. And understanding that his orders will be in the best interests of the country and that their sacrifice in fulfilling those orders will always serve the common good. But what we have clearly shown the last few weeks and what President Trump has shown us the past few years is that this promise flows only one way. As Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Many of us in this room are parents. We all try to teach our kids the important lessons of life. One of those lessons is that you won't always be the strongest, you won't always be the fastest, and you won't always win. There are a lot of things outside our control, but my wife and I have tried to teach our kids that what we can always control are our choices. It's in that spirit that hanging in my son's room is a quote from Harry Potter. The quote is from Professor Dumbledore, who said, it is our choices that show who we truly are, far more than our abilities. This trial will soon be over, but there will be many choices for all of us in the days ahead, the most pressing of which is how each of us will decide to fulfill our oath. More than our words, our choices will show the world who we really are, what type of leaders we will be and what type of nation we will be. So let me finish where I began with an explanation of why I am here standing before you. I've been carrying my kids' constitutions these last few weeks, and this morning I wrote a note to them to explain why I'm here. Our founders recognized the failings of all people, so they designed a system to ensure that the ideas and principles contained in this document would always be greater than any one person. It's the idea that no one is above the law. But our system only works if people stand up and fight for it. And fighting for something important always comes with a cost. 
Someday you may be called upon to defend the principles and ideas embodied in our Constitution. May the memory and spirit of those who sacrificed for them in the past guide you and give you strength as you fight for them in the future. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, and Counsel for the President, this is a defining moment in our history and a challenging time for our nation. A thousand things have gone through my mind since this body voted to not call witnesses in this trial. The vote was unprecedented. The President's former National Security Advisor indicated that he was willing to testify under oath before the Senate, yet this body did not want to hear what he had to say. The President's lawyers have asked you to not believe your lying eyes and ears, to reinterpret the Constitution, and to believe that if the President thinks his re-election is in our national interest, then he can do whatever he wants, anything, to make it happen. And that's exactly what he was attempting to do anything when he illegally held much-needed military aid while pressuring Ukraine's president to announce bogus investigations into his most feared political rival. This trial is about abuse of power, obstruction, breaking the law, and our system of checks and balances. And since we are talking about the President of the United States, this trial is also most certainly about character. I'm reminded today, Senators, of my own father. He worked more than one job. He didn't have a famous last name. His name appeared on no buildings. But my father was rich in something no money and apparently no powerful position can buy. You see, my father was a man who was decent honest, a man of integrity. And he was a man of good moral character. The president's lawyer never spoke about the president's character during this trial. And I find that quite telling. I joined the police department because I wanted to make a difference. And I believe I did. As a police chief, I was always concerned about the message we were sending inside the agency, especially to young recruits, especially to newly hired, dedicated police officers. We had to be careful about just how we were defining what was acceptable and unacceptable behavior inside the department and out in the community. Yes, people make mistakes. Yes, individuals make mistakes. But we had to be clear about the culture inside the organization. And we had to send a strong message that the police department was not a place where corruption could reside, where corruption was normalized and where corruption was covered up. Today, unfortunately, I believe we are holding young police recruits to a higher standard than we are the leader of the free world. If this body fails to hold this president accountable, you must ask yourselves what kind of republic will we ultimately have with a president who thinks 
that he can really, truly do whatever he wants. You will send a terrible message to the nation that one can get away with abuse of power, obstruction, cheating, and spreading false narratives if you simply know the right people. Well, today, senators, I reject that because we are a nation of laws. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, said this, America will never be destroyed from outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we chose to destroy ourselves. I urge you, senators, to vote to convict and remove this president. Thank you so much for your time. Mr. Chief Justice, distinguished members of the Senate, President's Council, I mentioned on the floor last week that Alexander Hamilton has played a starring role during this impeachment trial, but Ben Franklin has only made a cameo appearance. But that cameo appearance was an important one. When he made the observation in the aftermath of that convention in 1787, that the framers of the Constitution had created a republic if you can keep it. Why would Dr. Franklin express ambiguity about the future of America during such a triumphant moment? Perhaps it was because the system of government that was created at that convention, checks and balances, separate and co-equal branches of government, the independent judiciary, the free and fair press, the preeminence of the rule of law, all of those values, all of those ideas, all of those institutions had never before been put together in one form of government. So perhaps it was uncertain as to whether America could sustain it. But part of the brilliance of our great country is that year after year, decade after decade, century after century, we've held this democracy thing together. But now, all of those ideas, all of those values, all of those institutions are under assault, not from without, but from within. We've created a republic, if you can keep it. House managers have proven our case against President Trump with a mountain of evidence. President Trump tried to cheat, he got caught, and then he worked hard to cover it up. President Trump corruptly abused his power. President Trump obstructed a congressionally and constitutionally required impeachment inquiry with blanket defiance. President Trump solicited foreign interference in an American election and shredded the very fabric of our democracy. House managers have proven our case against President Trump with a mountain of evidence. If the Senate chooses to acquit under these circumstances, then America is in the wilderness. If the Senate chooses to normalize lawlessness, if the Senate chooses to normalize corruption, if the Senate chooses to normalize presidential abuse of power, then America is in the wilderness. If the Senate chooses to acquit President Trump without issuing a single subpoena, without interviewing a single witness, without reviewing a single new document, then America is truly in the wilderness. But all is not lost. 
even at this late hour, the Senate can still do the right thing. America is watching. The world is watching. The eyes of history are watching. The Senate can still do the right thing. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and the seventh verse, encourages us to walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We've come this far by faith. And so I say to all of you, my fellow Americans, walk by faith. Democrats and Republicans, progressives and conservatives, the left and the right, all points in between, walk by faith. There are patriots all throughout this chamber, patriots who can be found all throughout the land, in urban America, rural America, suburban America, small town America, walk by faith. Through the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys, the trials and the tribulations of this turbulent moment. Walk by faith. Faith in the Constitution, faith in our democracy, faith in the rule of law, faith in government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Faith in Almighty God. Walk by faith. The Senate can still do the right thing. And if we come together as Americans, then together we can eradicate the cancer that threatens our democracy and continue our long, necessary, and majestic march toward a more perfect union. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I want to begin by thanking you for the distinguished way you have presided over these proceedings. Senators, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. If Lincoln could speak these words during the Civil War, surely we can live them now and overcome our divisions and our animosities. It is midnight in Washington. The lights are finally going out in the Capitol after a long day in the impeachment trial of Donald J. Trump. The Senate heard arguments only hours earlier on whether to call witnesses and require the administration to release documents it has withheld. Counsel for the President still maintains the President's innocence while opposing any additional evidence that would prove otherwise. It is midnight in Washington. But on this night, not all the lights have been extinguished. Somewhere in the bowels of the Justice Department, Donald Trump's Justice Department, a light remains on. Someone has waited until the country is asleep to hit send, to inform the court in a filing due that day that the Justice Department, the department that would represent justice, is refusing to produce documents directly bearing on the President's decision to withhold military aid from Ukraine. The Trump administration has them, it is not turning them over, and it does not want the Senate to know until it is too late. Send. That's what happened last Friday night when you left home for the weekend. In a replay of the duplicity we saw during the trial, when the President's lawyers argued here that the House must go to court and argued in court that the House must come here, they were at it again telling the court in a midnight filing that it would not turn over relevant documents even as they argued here that they were not covering up the president's misdeeds. Midnight in Washington. All too tragic, a metaphor for where the country finds itself at the conclusion of the only the third impeachment in history and the first impeachment trial without witnesses or documents, the first such trial or non-trial in impeachment history. How did we get here? In the beginning of this proceeding, you did not know whether we could prove our case. Many senators, like many Americans, did not have the opportunity to watch much, let alone all of the open hearings in the House during our investigation. And none of us could anticipate what defenses the president might offer. 
Now you have seen what we promised, overwhelming evidence of the President's guilt. Donald John Trump withheld hundreds of millions of dollars to an ally at war and a coveted White House meeting with their President to coerce or extort that nation's help to cheat in our elections. And when he was found out, he engaged in the most comprehensive effort to cover up his misconduct in the history of presidential impeachment, fighting all subpoenas for documents and witnesses and using his own obstruction as a sword and a shield. Arguing here, the House did not fight hard enough to overcome their non-invocation of privilege in court, and in court that the House must not be heard to enforce their subpoenas, but that impeachment is a proper remedy. Having failed to persuade this Senate or the public that there was no quid pro quo, having offered no evidence to contradict the record, the President's team opted in a kind of desperation for a different kind of defense. First, prevent the Senate and the public from hearing from witnesses with the most damning accounts of the President's misconduct. And second, fall back on a theory of presidential power so broad and unaccountable that it would allow any occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania to be as corrupt as he chooses while the Congress is powerless to do anything about it. That defense collapsed of its own dead weight. Presidents may abuse their power with impunity, they argued. Abuse of power is not a constitutional crime, they claimed. Only statutory crime is a constitutional crime, even though there were no statutory crimes when the Constitution was adopted. The President had to look far and wide to find a de defense lawyer to make such an argument, unsupported by history, the founders, or common sense. The Republican expert witness in the House would not make it. Serious constitutional scholars would not make it. Even Alan Dershowitz would not make it. At least he wouldn't in 1998. But this has become the President's defense. And yet, this defense proved indefensible. If abuse of power is not impeachable, even though it is clear the founders considered the highest of all high crimes and misdemeanors, but if it were not impeachable, then a whole range of utterly unacceptable conduct in a president would now be beyond reach. Trump could offer Alaska to the Russians in exchange for support in the next election, or decide to move to Mar-a-Lago permanently and let Jared Kushner run the country, delegating to him the decision whether to go to war. Because those things are not necessarily criminal, this argument would allow that he could not be impeached for such abuses of power. Of course, this would be absurd. More than absurd, it would be dangerous. And so Mr. Dershowitz tried to embellish his legal creation and distinguish among those abuses of power which would be impeachable from those which wouldn't. Abuses of power that would help the president get reelected were permissible and therefore unimpeachable and only those for pecuniary gain were beyond the pale. Under this theory, as long as the president believed his reelection was in the public interest, he could do anything, and no quid pro quo was too corrupt. No damage to our national security too great. This was such an extreme view that even the president's other lawyers had to run away from it. So what are we left with? The House has proven the president's guilt. He tried to coerce an ally into helping him cheat by smearing his opponent. He betrayed our national security in order to do it when he withheld military aid to our ally and violated the law to do so. He covered it up and he covers it up still. His continuing obstruction is a threat to the oversight and investigatory powers of the House and Senate and if left unaddressed will permanently and dangerously alter the balance of power. These undeniable facts required the president to retreat to his final defense. He's guilty as sin, but can't we just let the voters decide? He's guilty as sin, but why not let the voters clean up this mess? And here, to answer that question, we must look at the history of this presidency and to the character of this president, or lack of character, and ask, can we be confident that he will not continue to try to cheat in that very election? Can we be confident that Americans 
and not foreign powers will get to decide, and that the president will shun any further foreign interference in our democratic affairs. And the short, plain, sad, incontestable answer is no, you can't. You can't trust this president to do the right thing, not for one minute, not for one election, not for the sake of our country. You just can't. He will not change, and you know it. In 2016, he invited foreign interference in our election. Hey, Russia, if you're listening, hack Hillary's emails, he said, and they did, immediately. And when the Russians started dumping them before the election, he made use of them in every conceivable way, touting the filthy lucre at campaign stops more than 100 times. When he was investigated, he did everything he could to obstruct justice, going so far as to fire the FBI director and try to fire the special counsel and ask the White House counsel to lie on his behalf. During the same campaign, while telling the country he had no business dealings with Russia, he was continuing to actively pursue the most lucrative deal of his life, a Trump Tower in the heart of Moscow. Six close associates of the president would be indicted or go to jail in connection with the president's campaign, Russia, and the effort to cover it up. On the day after that tragic chapter appeared to come to an end with Bob Mueller's testimony, Donald Trump was back on the phone, this time with another foreign power, Ukraine, and once again seeking foreign help with his election. Only this time, he had the full powers of the presidency at his disposal. This time, he could use coercion. This time, he could withhold aid from a nation whose soldiers were dying every week. This time, he believed he could do whatever he wanted under Article II. And this time, when he was caught, he could make sure that the Justice Department would never investigate the matter. And they didn't. Donald Trump had no more Jeff Sessions. He had just the man he wanted in Bill Barr, a man whose view of the imperial presidency, a presidency in which the Department of Justice is little more than an extension of the White House counsel, is to do the president's bidding. So Congress had to do the investigation itself. And just as before, he obstructed that investigation in every way. He has not changed. He will not change. He has made that clear himself without self-awareness or hesitation. A man without character or ethical compass will never find his way. Even as the most recent and most egregious misconduct was discovered, he was unapologetic, unrepented, and more dangerous, undeterred. He continued pressing Ukraine to smear his rivals even as the investigation was underway. He invited new countries to get involved in the act, calling on China to do the same. His personal emissary, Rudy Giuliani, dispatched himself to Ukraine, trying to get further foreign interference in our election. The plot goes on, the scheming persists, and the danger will never recede. He has done it before, he will do it again. What are the odds, if left in office, that he will continue trying to cheat? I will tell you, 100%. Not five, not 10, or even 50, but 100%. If you have found him guilty and you do not remove him from office, he will continue trying to cheat in the election until he succeeds. Then what shall you say? What shall you say if Russia again interferes in our election and Donald Trump does nothing but celebrate their efforts? What shall you say if Ukraine capitulates and announces investigations into the president's rivals? What shall you say in future when candidates compete for the allegiance of foreign powers in their elections, when they draft their platforms so to encourage foreign intervention in their campaign? Foreign nations as the most super of super PACs of them all, if not legal, somehow permissible, because Donald Trump has made it so, and we refuse to do anything about it but wring our hands. They'll hack your opponent's emails, they'll mount a social media campaign to support you, they'll announce investigations of your opponent to help you, and all for the asking. Leave 
Donald Trump in office after you have found him guilty, and this is the future that you will invite. Now, we have known since the day we brought these charges that the bar to conviction requiring fully two-thirds of the Senate may be prohibitively high. And yet the alternative is a runaway presidency and a nation whose elections are open to the highest bidder. And so you might ask how, given the gravity of the president's misconduct, given the abundance of evidence of his guilt, given the acknowledgement by senators in both parties of that guilt, how have we arrived here with so little common ground? Why was the Nixon impeachment bipartisan? Why was the Clinton impeachment much less so? And why is the gulf between the parties even greater today? It is not for the reason the president's lawyers would have you believe. Although they have claimed many times in many ways that the process in the House was flawed because we did not allow the president to control it, it was in reality little different than the process in prior impeachments. The circumstances, of course, were different. The Watergate investigation began in the Senate and it progressed before it got moving in the House. And there, of course, much of the investigative work had been done by the special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski. In Clinton, there was likewise an independent counsel that conducted a multi-year investigation that started with a real estate deal in Arkansas and ended with a blue dress. Nixon and Clinton, of course, played no role in those investigations before they moved to the House Judiciary Committee. But to the degree you can compare the process when it got to the Judiciary Committee in either prior and recent impeachments, it was largely the same as we have here. The president had the right to call witnesses to ask questions and chose not to. The House majorities in Nixon and Clinton did not cede their subpoena power to their minorities and neither did we here. Although then, as now, we gave the minority the right to request subpoenas and to compel a vote, and they did. So the due process the House presided here, provided here was essentially the same and in some ways even greater. Nevertheless, the President's counsel hopes that through sheer repetition, they can convert non-truth into truth. Do not let them. Every single court to hear Mr. Philbin's arguments has rejected them. The subpoenas are invalid, rejected by the McGahn Court. They have absolute immunity, rejected by the McGahn Court. Privilege may conceal crime or fraud, rejected by the court in Nixon. But if the process here was substantially the same, the facts of the president's misconduct were very different from one impeachment to the next. The Republican Party of Nixon's time broke into the DNC and the president covered it up. Nixon too abused the power of his office to gain an unfair advantage over his opponent. But in Watergate, he never sought to coerce a foreign power to aid his reelection nor did he sacrifice our national security in such a palpable and destructive way as withholding aid from an ally at war. And he certainly did not engage in the wholesale obstruction of Congress or justice that we have seen this president commit. The facts of the President Clinton's misconduct pale in comparison to Nixon and do not hold a candle to Donald Trump. Lying about an affair is morally wrong, and when under oath, it is a crime, but it had nothing to do with his duties in office. The process being the same, the facts of President Trump's misconduct being far more destructive than either past president, what then accounts for the disparate result in bipartisan support for his removal? What has changed? The short answer is, we have changed. The members of Congress have changed. For reasons as varied as the stars, the members of this body and ours in the House are now far more accepting of the most serious misconduct of a president as long as it is a president of one's own party. And that is a trend most dangerous for our country. Fifty years ago, no lawyer representing the president would have ever made the outlandish argument that if the president believes his corruption will serve to get him reelected, whether it is by coercing an ally to help him cheat 
or in any other form that he may not be impeached. That this is somehow a permissible use of his power. But here we are. The argument has been made, and some appear ready to accept it, and that is dangerous, for there is no limiting principle to that position. It must have come as a shock, a pleasant shock to this president, that our norms and institutions would prove to be so weak. The independence of the Justice Department and its formerly proud Office of Legal Counsel, now mere legal tools at the president's disposal, to investigate enemies or churn out helpful opinions not worth the paper they are written on. The FBI painted by a president as corrupt and disloyal. The intelligence community not to be trusted against the good counsel of Vladimir Putin. The press portrayed as enemies of the people. The daily attacks on the guardrails of our democracy so relentlessly assailed have made us numb and blind to the consequences. Does none of that matter anymore if he's the president of our party? I hope and pray that we never have a president like Donald Trump in the Democratic Party, one that would betray the national interest and the country's security to help with his reelection. And I would hope to God that if we did, we would impeach him and Democrats would lead the way. But I suppose you never know just how difficult that is until you are confronted with it. But you, my friends, are confronted with it. You are confronted with that difficulty now, and you must not shrink from it. History will not be kind to Donald Trump. I think we all know that. Not because it will be written by never Trumpers, but because whenever we have departed from the values of our nation, we have come to regret it. And that regret is written all over the pages of our history. If you find that the House has proved its case and still vote to acquit, your name will be tied to his with a cord of steel and for all of history. But if you find the courage to stand up to him, to speak the awful truth to his rank falsehood, your place will be among the Davids who took on Goliath. If only you will say enough. We revere the wisdom of our founders and the insights they had into self-governance. We scour their words for hidden meaning and try to place ourselves in their shoes. But we have one advantage that the founders did not. For all their genius, they could not see but opaquely into the future. We, on the other hand, have the advantage of time, of seeing how their great experiment in self-governance has progressed. When we look at the sweep of history, there are times when our nation and the rest of the world have moved with a seemingly irresistible force in the direction of greater freedom. More freedom to speak and to assemble, to practice our faith and tolerate the faith of others to love whom we would and choose love over hate. More free societies, walls tumbling down, nations reborn. But then, like a pendulum approaching the end of its arc, the outward movement begins to arrest. The golden globe of freedom reaches its zenith and starts to retreat. The pendulum swings back past the center and recedes into a dark unknown. How much farther it will travel in its illiberal direction, how many more freedoms will be extinguished before it turns back, we cannot say. But what we do here, in this moment, will affect its course and its correction. Every single vote, even a single vote, by a single member can change the course of history. It is said that a single man or woman of courage makes a majority. Is there one among you who will say, enough? America believes in a thing called truth. She does not believe we are entitled to our own alternate facts. She recoils at those who spread pernicious falsehoods. To her, truth matters. There is nothing more corrosive to a democracy than the idea that there is no truth. America also believes there is a difference between right 
and wrong and right matters here. But there is more. Truth matters, right matters, but so does decency. Decency matters. When the president smears a patriotic public servant like Marie Ivanovich in pursuit of a corrupt aim, we recoil. When the president mocks the disabled, a war hero who is a prisoner of war or a gold star father, we are appalled because decency matters here. And when the president tries to coerce an ally to help him cheat in our elections and then covers it up, we must say enough, enough. He has betrayed our national security and he will do so again. He has compromised our elections and he will do so again. You will not change him. You cannot constrain him. He is who he is. Truth matters little to him. What's right matters even less and decency matters not at all. I do not ask you to convict him because truth or right or decency matters nothing to him, but because we have proven our case and it matters to you. Truth matters to you. Right matters to you. You are decent. He is not who you are. In Federalist 55, James Madison wrote, that there were certain qualities in human nature, qualities I believe like honesty, right, and decency, which should justify our confidence in self-government. He believed that we possessed sufficient virtue, that the chains of despotism were not necessary to restrain ourselves from destroying and devouring one another. It may be midnight in Washington, but the sun will rise again. I put my faith in the optimism of the founders. You should too. They gave us the tools to do the job, a remedy as powerful as the evil it was meant to constrain, impeachment. They meant it to be used rarely, but they put it in the Constitution for a reason, for a man who would sell out his country for a political favor, for a man who would threaten the integrity of our elections, for a man who would invite foreign interference in our affairs, for a man who would undermine our national security and that of our allies, for a man like Donald J. Trump. They gave you a remedy and they meant for you to use it. They gave you an oath and they meant for you to observe it. We have proven Donald Trump guilty now do impartial justice and convict him. I yield back. The majority leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I ask unanimous consent. The Senate sitting in a, as a court, court of impeachment stand adjourned under the previous order. Without objection, so ordered. I suggest the absence of a quorum. Mr. Alexander. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for watching Fox News Now. The final vote on impeachment will be Wednesday at 4 Eastern to Arizona time. You bet you'll be able to watch it right here on Fox News Now Live. Meanwhile, we're going to stay on standby here for just a few moments, see if anybody decides to come and talk to the media. Again, the final vote on impeachment is Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern.